We've been on the theme. We've been going through different things, different series of sermons. The first one we started off with was working together for the good of the kingdom. Then we moved on to not understanding the plan, but trusting in the great I am. And now today we're, we're moving on to a new theme and a new series of sermons. And that theme is the power of prayer in the life of a believer. There is power in prayer in the life of a believer. And we need to operate in that power. We need to have a prayer life. We need to understand what prayer will do in a life of a believer. The Bible says that the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And the NIV says it's powerful and effective. We watched the, the war room yesterday. And inside of the movie, a couple things caught my attention. And one of the biggest things that caught my attention was she told the young lady that victory is by no accident. In other words, our victory is not by accident. Our victory is not a coincidence. Our victory is not something that we have come up with. Our victory is in Jesus the Christ. Our victory is in the power of prayer. Our victory comes in our prayer life. And we need to pray for one another. We need to stand in the gap for one another. The altar call is good. We're supposed to have an altar call. We're supposed to stand in the gap and, and pray and leave our request at the altar. But you need to have your own prayer life. I'm not talking about just praying when you wake up in the morning time and thank the Lord for allowing you to see another day. I'm not talking about praying when it's dinner time or, or breakfast time or lunch time or when it's time for you to go to bed. You need to pray throughout the day. You need to have a prayer life. That's how you have a relationship with the Father. It's through prayer. And there's power in prayer for the life of, of a believer. We got to get to the point where we're praying without ceasing. The times are near. You see what's taking place. You see what's going on in the world. You hear what's happening with the debates and who's leading and carrying on. If there ever was a time to pray, now is the time to pray. Which brings me to the title of the first sermon of this series. Remember me, O oh Lord. I need to do a little background before I can get us to the heart of the text. Judah had been a, a vassal state, a slave state, under Assyria since the reign of King Ahaz. Hezekiah's father. When Sargon, ruler of Assyria, died in battle and Sennacherib took the throne, it seemed to Hezekiah an opportune time to break that yoke. Sennacherib was involved in other empire concerns. So Hezekiah didn't send him the annual tribute. Judah had 
had been victorious over the Philistines. So that the kingdom was feeling strong. In 1722 BC, Assyria attacked Israel and captured the city of Samaria. And this meant that the Assyrian army was now right next door to Judah. In 1715 BC, Sennacherib Senator invaded Judah and headed toward Jerusalem. Hezekiah's faith at this point was very weak. So he humbled himself before the king and paid the tribute money that he owed. That's in chapter 18, somewhere around the, the 7th through 16th verse. 11 tons of silver and one ton of gold. Some of the wealth came from the king's own treasure. But it's disappointing to see that Hezekiah took the rest of it from the temple of the Lord. It's a shame when you get to the point where you start taking outside, taking money from the house of God. The house of God is a place where it should be of abundance. The house should never be in rear. The house should always be overflowing. But, but I, I'm gonna get into that. We, we, we gonna go there a, another time. We, we gonna talk about the tithing and, and how the, the house of God should be filled. But, I, but I'm not going there right now. But we will be back. House of God should never be without an overflow. He followed the bad example of his father. But King David never negotiated with his enemies or tried to buy them off. He attacked and defeated them. King David had a prayer life. He knew who to take the battle to. He knew who to go to. He knew who his I am was. King David was a praying man. He, he knew how to pray when he sinned. And he knew how to pray when he asked for deliverance. He never negotiated because he knew who was fighting his battles. But Hezekiah caught up in his pride and in sin. He negotiated so that the Assyrians would not attack them and pay them off and even went inside of the house of God and, and took the gold off of the gold post, off the door posts and, and stripped the house of God to, to pay somebody. And because of that, his faith at that point was weak. Now, the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, told Hezekiah, don't let the God you depend on deceive you. When he says Jerusalem will not be handed over to the king of Assyria. He said, have you not heard what I have done to all the countries? Where is the God of Gozan, Haran, Rezeb, the people of Eden who were in Tel Azar? Where is the king of Havmah, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Shephavim, or Hena, or Ava? Where are all these nations at? He said, don't allow this God you depend on to deceive you and tell you that Jerusalem will not be handed over into my hands. Oh, the king of Assyria was arrogant and he was talking trash. And he told Hezekiah, don't depend on 
your God. But I, I want you to understand something. We have to depend on the true and living God. We have to call on the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Bible tells us not to lean on our own understanding, but to acknowledge him in all of our ways, and he shall direct our paths. If you don't call on God, who you going to call on? God said, I'm not a man that I should lie, nor the son of man that changed my mind. We don't serve a God who deceives us. We don't serve a God who leaves us. We don't serve a God that is not able to deliver us. But this king had destroyed all of the nations. And he told Hezekiah, in other words, you're next. At this point, Hezekiah knows that the situation is hopeless. So now he knows that he has to turn to God and cry out to God. He understands that the battle cannot be won without God. And Hezekiah goes into prayer. He finds his secret place. See, David knew how to find a secret place. And we, and we need to find our secret place. Inside of the, the war room movie, she had a war room, a, a closet where she went inside and she had scriptures posted on the, on the, on the walls and taped on the walls inside of this closet. In other words, what I'm trying to say is we have to get the word of God inside of us in order to pray a good prayer. So you need to use the word of God when you're praying. So Hezekiah goes into prayer and he says, Oh Lord, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made the heaven and the earth. Give ear, O oh Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O oh Lord, and see. Listen to the words Senator Cherub has sent to insult the living God. It is true, O oh Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. But now, O oh Lord our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are God. He prayed a powerful prayer. He said, God is true. The king of Assyria has laid waste all of these lands. He said, but I'm calling on you now that you will deliver us out of his hand and show the rest of the nations who you are. He finally got to the point where he called on God. That's where your strength comes from when you call on the name of God. That's where your help comes from when you call on the name of God. That's how he brings you over troubled waters when you call on the name of God. That's how he brings you out of the muck and the mire when you call on the name of God. When things are not seeming right, you need to call on the name of God. And Hezekiah learned to call on God. But now Hezekiah faced another dilemma. But now his prayer life is strong. He understands who's in control. He understands who's fighting his battle. But because of his sin, because of his pride, it brought trouble in his life. So here it is, he's, he's faced with another, another dilemma. But thank be to God that he, he turned back to God. Thank God that he, that he called on God because now 
he knows how to pray to the true and living God. And which brings us to the text. The Bible says in those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. But the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, this is what the Lord says. Put your house in order because you are going to die. You will not recover. Hezekiah turned and, and faced the wall and prayed to the Lord and said, Remember, O oh Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully in wholehearted devotion and have done what is good and right in your eyes. And the Bible says that he, that he wept bitterly. The first thing that, that, that he does, the first word that comes back to him, it says, Get your house in order. The first thing we need to do is get our house in order. For tomorrow is not promised to any one of us. So the first thing God tells them is you need to get your house in order. In other words, you not only need to get your house in order, but you need to get your, your life in order. You need to get right before God because we don't know the hour. Amen. The time is near. And God says, I, I want you to get your house in order. In other words, have your will. Because, in other words, Hezekiah was getting ready to die. And God said, you need to get your house in order. In other words, you had to have a will. We need to have things mapped out so that our, our families and our loved ones will be taken care of when we're gone. We need to have these things already set up. It's a tough thing to do, but this is not our home. This is, we're not citizens here. Our citizenship is in the kingdom of heaven. And the Bible says a, a, a good person lives, leaves an inheritance for his children's children. So we need to make sure that we set up. And God says, get your house in order. Then he goes on to say, because you're going to die. And you will not recover. Has anybody ever told you that you won't come back from this situation? You know, the enemy doesn't want us to recover. The enemy doesn't want us to come back when we, when we fall by the wayside or, or when trouble comes in our life. He don't want us to come out of that situation. Have you ever heard somebody say that you won't recover? Have you ever been to the doctor and the doctor said you won't recover or you won't come out of this situation? But I want you to know our setback is only a setup for our comeback. The Bible says that Hezekiah now turns and faces the wall. And he says, remember me. Amen, amen. In other words, what I'm trying to get at, oh bro, is he didn't turn around and say, let me call Bob, John, Bill, Mary, Jill. The Bible says he turned around and he faced the wall. And when he faced the wall, the Bible says that he, he cried out to God and he said, remember me. Hold on, how I have walked faithfully before thee, how I have been good in your eyesight. He said, remember me, Lord, remember me, how I've done everything according to what you have called me to do. And the Bible goes on to say that before Isaiah left out of the middle courtyard, the Bible says that God said, go back. And when he went back, he told Hezekiah, he said, God said, I've heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. I understand everything that is going on in your life. He said, not only that, but I'm going to add 15 more years to your life. And not only am I going to add 15 years to your life, but I'm going to destroy the Assyrians that are trying to attack you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to keep this 
nation or when I'm trying to get it or grow when trouble come your way you need to cry out remember me oh Lord when the enemy come in and try to destroy your marriage you need to say remember me oh Lord when the doctors diagnose you you need to say remember me Oh Lord, when you're going through troubling times and it seems like you just can't get over the hump, you need to find your secret place and say, Oh Lord, remember me when the troubling waters come your way and the enemy, listen, the Bible says that in this life you shall have persecution. He said in this life you'll have trouble, but fear not, for I have overcome the world, but the enemy is coming to steal, kill, and destroy, but I want you to know something, when the enemy come in like a flood, when the enemy try to destroy, see the enemy will try to destroy, when God is blessing you in your life, when God is getting ready to elevate you, the enemy will come in and try to destroy you, and when he can't destroy you, he'll see, he'll send the deceiving, the sin of deceiver that try to trick you. But I want you to understand the enemy can come on my way. He can try to shift what God is doing. You can try to stop what God is doing. You can try to turn around what God is doing. But when God is blessing me, when God is strengthening me, when God is fighting my battles, when I feel weak, when I feel hard pressed up on every single
sexual immorality, homosexuality, doesn't matter what you did, because I'm reminded at the sixth hour, at the sixth hour, I'm reminded when Jesus was on the cross, and my Bible tells me, see, see, folk like to hold your past uh, over your head. They like to hold what you've done uh, in the past. They like to look at the outward appearance, uh, but God looks at the heart. I'm so glad that at that sixth hour, when Jesus was hanging on that tree, uh, the, the Bible tells me that the thief uh, on his right uh, said, remember me, oh Lord, uh, when you're in your kingdom, my Bible says that Jesus said uh, today, he didn't say next year, he didn't say next month, uh, he didn't say 15 years later, my Bible says today you shall be in paradise with me. I'm so glad that I serve a God that remembers me and not my past. Because if God remembered any of our past, we'd be doomed. The Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. There's not one in here that is without sin. And if you claim to be without sin, you make God out to be a liar. And God is not a liar. Oh! 
heart, uh, remember me. Uh, if you are walking right, uh, we'll protect your children. Even if your children aren't doing what they're supposed to do. I'm so glad uh, that when I live my life uh, according to his will, all I have to do is cry out, remember me, oh Lord. Remember me. And he began to praise God. And he said, you restored me to health. And let me live. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered anguish. And you kept me in your love. Hezekiah praised God for what he went through. He said it benefited him. That he went through what he went through. You know why we go through what we go through? So that God get our heart right. Amen. That we're able to walk accordingly. That's why we go through the things that we go through. And we need to praise God while we're going through it. On the mountaintop and in the valley. We need to praise God. For he is most worthy to be praised. We got to get our prayer life stronger. We need to pray for each other. You need to pray for your pastor. God is getting ready to take us somewhere. And the enemy don't want to see that happen. So he'll try to come in, but God says, you're not unaware of the enemy's schemes. We need to pray for each other and each other's families. People, families are going through. We have to have a stronger prayer life. And we're going to hit a lot of series on different sermons on prayer. Because prayer is the most important part of a believer's life. Prayer is what brings us through. We heard some powerful testimonies yesterday about how prayer brought the person through. It wasn't them that brought them out of that situation. It was the prayer. It was, it was God that brought you out of that situation. And we had to live a life of prayer. For there's power in prayer for the life of a believer. And if you're going through Oak Grove, find your secret place and cry out Remember me, O oh Lord. Amen. 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 Let's stand to our feet.